The Bible calls us saints, which means holy ones, because God has separated us from sin and blessed us for His service. Most Christians would agree that we have a need for personal holiness. However, we have difficulty in agreeing as to how this holiness actually comes about. Welcome to Every Last Word, a radio and internet program with Dr. Philip Ryken, teaching the whole Bible to change your whole life. Today we continue our study in the message of salvation as we look at the biblical teaching of being saved to sin no more. We'll hear what implications that has for faithful everyday living. Well, Phil, today you'll discuss holiness and the believer's sanctification as a key point in the message of salvation. Yeah, that's right, Mark. We've been having a series on the message of salvation, and in our recent messages, we've been talking about what God has done for us, for example, justifying us, adopting us into his family. But today we're going to be looking at what God does in us as he sanctifies us, or maybe a simpler way of saying that is as he makes us more holy. And that's a process of dying to sin and living in righteousness. Well, what does dying to that old sinful self actually look like as we live out our daily lives? Well, Mark, you know, we're going to see something very interesting in today's passage from Romans, that when the Apostle Paul begins to talk about the process by which we become more holy. He doesn't begin with something that we do. He begins with something that Jesus has done. He begins with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now, as we are growing in holiness, we are depending upon the work that God has done. And as we do that, of course, we need to resist sin. We need to put sin to death. We need to offer ourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. But here's something that many people are missing in their desire for holiness, and that's beginning with the foundation of what Jesus has done. Thank you, Phil. Turn in your Bible now to Romans chapter 6, and let's hear God's Word for us today. I suppose that everyone who is saved by grace, senses the need for personal holiness. We know that we are set apart to be holy or sanctified, as the Bible calls it. Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus chapter 19, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Jesus went so far as to say, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Bible calls us saints, which means holy ones, because God has separated us from sin and consecrated us for his service. And I suppose that all Christians agree that we have a need for personal holiness. What Christians have difficulty agreeing about is how holiness happens. How do we grow spiritually? How do we gain victory over sin? What is the gospel method of sanctification? These may seem like simple questions, but there is widespread disagreement about how to answer them. Some churches teach that sanctification is a matter of moral effort. Human beings were created good and have the capacity for unhindered moral progress as long as we apply ourselves. Others teach that we are made holy primarily by the sacraments, which impart sanctifying grace. Some say that there are two kinds of Christians, carnal Christians and spiritual Christians. And one becomes a Christian, first of all, by trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior. However, Christians remain more or less carnally sinful until they decide also to trust in Jesus as Lord. Others insist that it is possible to live without committing any sin, or at least any known sin. The goal of the Christian life is to achieve perfection on this side of eternity, and still others say that entire sanctification comes after conversion through some second blessing of the Holy Spirit. Well, which view is right? You can see quite easily that whichever view one takes makes a great deal of practical difference. Do I still have a sinful nature or not? Do I grow in grace by receiving the sacraments or perhaps by reading the Ten Commandments? Is God already at work to make me holy or do I need some special new experience of His Holy Spirit? 
This confusion about sanctification often leads to spiritual frustration. If God wants me to be perfect, then why am I so imperfect? Some Christians wonder. I keep committing the same sins over and over again. I know I must not be living the victorious Christian life. Maybe I'm not really a Christian after all. Unfortunately, the various interpretations of Romans 6 sometimes add to the confusion. Here in verse 2, Paul asks a rhetorical question. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? For the perfectionist, this is proof that Christians do not sin, or at least that we do not commit any known sin. We are dead to sin, which means that we are now insensible to it, so insensible to temptation that we no longer respond to it. Others admit that we do sin, but maintain that it is up to us to put sin to death. And sanctification, they say, is a matter of dying to sin day by day. Well, of course, the way to resolve some of this confusion is to see what the Bible really says. And when properly understood, this second verse really does contain the first key to unlocking the mysteries of sanctification. And it says it very simply, we died to sin. Now, when exactly did we die to sin? Obviously, this is something that has already happened. The Bible gives us several clues. One clue is that the word occurs in the aorist tense. It's a tense to indicate an event that has already happened at some particular definite time in the past. Another clue is that the phrase died to sin appears again in verse 10, where it refers to Jesus Christ. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. And obviously, the Bible is speaking about that death that Christ died on the cross. And on the basis of these clues, we may at least deduce that we died to sin when Christ died to sin. We might say on the very day of his crucifixion. I've mentioned this before, but you know, at least four things were nailed to the cross of Calvary. One was a sign announcing that Jesus of Nazareth was the King of the Jews. Another was our Lord Jesus himself who was fixed to the cross with hammer and nails. The third thing was the debt of our sin, which God canceled by nailing it to the cross. And you see, the last thing that was nailed to the cross with Christ was every Christian. You see it again in verse 6, For we know that our old self was crucified with him. The Puritan William Perkins said, consider Christ crucified and believe that he was crucified for us. And this being done, we must yet go further. And as it were, spread ourselves on the cross of Christ, believing and beholding ourselves crucified with him. And then take it one step further. Not only were you crucified with Christ, but you were also buried with him. But don't you know? Verse 3, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. And what the scripture means when it says that we were baptized into Christ is that we were identified with him. We were identified with him in every way, including his burial. You know, whenever we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, we testify that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. And our sanctification begins with understanding that when Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, you were crucified, dead, and buried with him. And understand why the Bible speaks this way. It helps to remember the doctrine of union with Christ. We said that the Christian is joined to Christ in a vital, unbreakable spiritual union. And we identify that union as the source of every blessing in salvation. And that union with Christ means that we are connected to Christ in the closest possible way. And because we are connected to Christ, we are connected to everything that he ever did for our salvation, including, you see, his death and his burial. And to say that we died to sin is to say, as it says in verse 8, that we died with Christ. Or as it says in verse 5, that we have been united with him in his death. But of course, death is not the end, either for Christ 
or for us. And so the scripture goes on to say that Christ was raised from the dead and that we were raised with him. Paul says this at the end of verse 4, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may live a new life. He says it again at the end of verse 5, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. And again at verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. You see, we are united to Christ in both his crucifixion and his resurrection. He is the living Christ, and to be united to him is to receive the power of his life as well as the benefit of his death. This is where sanctification starts. Sanctification starts with the finished work of Christ, his death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, and his resurrection from the dead. These are simply the basic facts of the gospel. And it only makes sense that when we start to live by the gospel, that we start with these same historical facts. Spiritual growth does not begin with something that we think or feel or even do. It begins with something that Christ has done for us on a rough piece of wood and in an empty stone tomb and in the heavenly realms of glory. The sanctification of the Christian follows the pattern of salvation in Christ. First comes death. We died to sin just as Christ died to sin. This phrase is often misunderstood to mean that Christ died for our sins, and that's true, of course. Our salvation depends upon it, but it doesn't seem to be what is taught here. Instead, Romans 6 verse 10 says, the death he died He died to sin once for all. I think this verse says what it means and means what it says, that Christ died to sin. In other words, the crucifixion ended his relationship to sin once and for all. While he was dying on the cross, Christ was carrying all of the sins of all of his people. The scripture says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. And so for a time, in a way, sin had power over him. It was for this reason that he had to die, because the wages of sin is death. You see, as soon as Jesus died, he was done with sin forever. And from that time on, sin had no claim on him, no power to hold him. What the Scripture is saying to us is that the same thing has happened to the Christian. We died to sin before we were saved by grace Through faith, we were alive to sin with all of its perilous possibilities. We were so attached to our sins that we were unable to escape. In verse 6, Paul describes that old sinful life as our old self. The old self is not that sinful nature that continues to trouble us even after we come to Christ. No, rather, it is that whole sinful life that we lived before we received the message of salvation. And the only way to be free from that old life was to die to sin altogether. In that death, we made a decisive, definitive, once-for-all break with the life of sin. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. The only way for us to be free from sin is for our whole old self to be put to death, and not just put to death, but also buried. As verse 6 goes on to say, the body of sin is done away with. And what better way to permanently get rid of a dead body than to bury it in the ground? We were buried with Christ in order to entomb the corpse of our old sinful self. Now, the result of our death and burial is that we have been delivered from sin. Sin no longer exercises a dominating, controlling influence over us. As it says at the end of verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. The general principle here is that dead men cannot be slaves The term of their enslavement ends at death. And if we have died to sin, therefore, we can no longer be held in its bondage. Our death and our burial with Christ mean the end of our servitude to sin. And from this point on, sin is no longer our master. 
Now, after the death and burial of the old self comes a whole new life of obedience to God. It's a new life that comes from being united to Christ by faith. If we died with Christ, verse 8, we believe that we will also live with him. You see, there's a logical connection between death and life, both for Christ and for us. And since there is only one Christ, anyone who is united to him in his crucifixion must also be united to him in his resurrection. Christ is the risen Savior. The new life that we receive from him is resurrection life. It's a life that will never end, a life that we live unto God now and forever. We may say, therefore, that sanctification is a matter of death and life, death to sin and life in Christ. And by virtue of being united to Christ in this way, in his death and in his resurrection, we have a new identity. We have been brought from our old life of sin into a new life of righteousness. In his commentary on these verses, John Stott compares the Christian's life, both old and new, to a set of books. He says, our biography is written in two volumes. Volume one is the story of the old man, the old self, of me before my conversion. Volume two is the story of the new man, the new self, of me after I was made a new creation in Christ. Volume one of my biography ended with the judicial death of the old self. I was a sinner. I deserved to die. I did die. I received my deserts in my substitute, with whom I have become one. Volume two of my biography opened with my resurrection. My old life having finished, a new life to God has begun. Now to this point, I have not said one word about anything that we do. It has all been about Christ and about being united to him in his death, in his resurrection. You see, Romans 6 has not been telling us what to do. It has been telling us what we already know. In fact, the word know shows up frequently. Verse 3, don't you know? Verse 6, for we know. And again in verse 9, for we know. You see, spiritual growth begins with knowing the message of salvation by grace. It begins with knowing the truth about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in his commentary on these verses, Dr. Boyce writes that the key to living the Christian life lies in first knowing that God has joined us to Jesus Christ, and that we are no longer subject to the reign of sin and death, but have been transferred to the kingdom of God's abounding grace. Now, if that is the key to living the Christian life, many Christians seem to have lost it. In their struggle to grow in godliness, they try one method after another. They read books. They listen to tapes. They start ambitious programs for personal devotions. They fast and pray. They vow never to commit the same old sins again. And yet nothing seems to work. And they end up feeling spiritually defeated. Have you ever felt that way? Often the problem is not so much what we are doing, it is where we are starting. Sanctification that is based on human effort is bound to fail. Real progress in holiness starts with knowing that we are united to Christ in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. And the way we conquer sin is first by believing in what God did for us when he joined us to Christ. Here is another way to say it. We are sanctified by faith. We do not become sanctified by trying a little harder to live a little better. We first become sanctified by believing the message of salvation. And so it was that at the time of his conversion, Paul heard these words from the lips of Jesus himself, I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may receive a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You see, that is what Jesus says about our sanctification, that it comes by having faith in him. Sanctification comes by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
Now, we are not sanctified by faith alone, however. I suppose this is one of the great differences between justification and sanctification. Well, justification is by faith alone. Our standing before God depends on the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by faith and thus has nothing to do with our own works. Sanctification differs from justification in that it deals with inherent righteousness, not simply a righteousness that God declares that we have on the basis of Christ, but a a righteousness that God actually infuses into us. And when it comes to inherent righteousness, to actual progress in holiness, God does have some work for us to do. Sanctification requires godly works that flow from genuine faith. You know, many, if not most, of the biblical texts on sanctification teach that holiness is hard work. And so, for example, Paul told the Philippians to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Where again, the writer to the Hebrews exhorts us to make every effort to be holy. So although sanctification begins with faith, that faith leads to works which also are part of our sanctification. Now when it comes to working out our sanctification, Romans 6, beginning at verse 11, gives us plenty of work to do. It's significant, I think, that these do's and don'ts are the first commands in the entire book of Romans. Romans 1-5 to proclaims the message of salvation from sin by grace through faith. Nearly all the verbs in those chapters are indicatives. We should perhaps have a grammar lesson. The verbs in those chapters are indicatives. That is, they state what is true about our salvation in Christ. An indicative is a sentence like, the hymnal is read. It simply states what is the case. And you see, here in Romans 6, we have the first imperatives. That is to say, the first commands. An imperative is a sentence like, pick up that red hymnal. It's something that tells us what to do. And the striking thing about the very first imperative in the whole book of Romans is that it takes us right back to all of the indicatives. See what the Scripture says in verse 11. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Dead to sin but alive in Christ. This is precisely what Paul has been talking about since the beginning of Romans, surely since the beginning of this chapter. He said it here six different times in about half a different ways. Having died to sin, we are alive in Christ. That is simply an indicative, a statement, a true statement about our spiritual condition in Christ. And you see now, when Paul finally tells us what to do about our progress in holiness, he tells us to count on what God has done. And hopefully we are starting to get the message that even when we begin living for God's glory, we continue to depend on what God has done for us in His grace. This word counting comes from the counting house. The Greek term for it is logizomai, from which we derive English words like logarithm and logistics. It means to keep a log, the way that a bookkeeper would do to make a careful computation of all known assets. And of course, one of the basic principles of accounting is that you can only count what is there. An accountant is only allowed to count those assets that are actually on account. And of course, the same principle holds true for our sanctification. We must consider ourselves, we must count ourselves to be what we actually are. And one thing that we know that we can count on is that because we died to sin, we have a new life in Christ. Nothing can change that. Nothing can change the fact that we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, this doesn't mean that we're immune to temptation. It doesn't mean that it's impossible for us to sin. But what it does mean is that we are dead to that old life. And we can never go back to it. You see, the way to holiness begins with pondering the great facts of our salvation, reflecting on them, holding them before our minds, and in every way, counting on them, depending upon them. The King James Version 
and at this point uses the word reckon instead of count. And this suggests a way to illustrate the biblical teaching about sanctification. The illustration comes from the days when the great ship sailed on the high seas. Under ideal conditions, a sailing vessel can establish its position by means of the sun and the stars. But when the weather is foggy or stormy, a ship might sail for days or even weeks without being able to get its bearings by direct observation. And on these occasions, the captain would sail by dead reckoning. He would take out his ship's log, first of all, the detailed record of its voyage up to that point, and he would continue to chart the ship's progress by keeping track of its speed and direction with the help of his compass. And to apply the illustration, I am saying that there are times when we must rely on dead reckoning to chart our progress towards holiness. On occasion, we are uncertain about our spiritual progress. We are lost in the fog of sin. We are tossed in the high seas of doubt. And the way to get our bearings is to go back to our ship's log. That is to say, it is to go back to the gospel message of salvation where it is plainly recorded that we died and arose with Christ. And even if we're not sure if we're making spiritual progress, even if we can't get our bearings by any kind of direct observation of our own godliness, we know where we have been. We have been with Christ on the cross. We have been with Christ in the tomb. And we have been with Christ on to glory. And you see, by that reckoning, we are dead to sin and alive to God. There's no need to doubt our sanctification, let alone our salvation. We can count on where we have been. And all we need to do now is point ourselves to Christ, the true north of the soul, and continue our voyage. Now, there are two last things we must do, one of them negative and the other positive. Negatively, we must resist the tyranny of sin with everything we have refusing to put ourselves in its service. The Scripture tells us, this is verse 12, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't obey its evil desires. Don't offer the parts of your body to sin. It refers to the parts of the body as instruments of wickedness. If we offer them to sin, the word instruments is the word for weaponry. The picture comes from the military. Sin is like an evil commandant that wants to use us in its war against God. And of course, sin does have a way of getting hold of our bodies. There are some sins we feel almost physically compelled to commit. And really what Paul is saying here is don't become the devil's tool. Don't let sin use the parts of your body to commit unrighteous acts. No doubt there are some of us who need to hear this warning. If you belong to Jesus Christ, then sin is not your master, so don't let it master you. This is one army you don't want to volunteer for. Of course, one of the implications of this verse is that sanctification is a struggle. The reason God tells us not to let sin reign is because it's always trying to. We are dead to sin. We are alive to God, but that doesn't mean that we find it easy to be holy. Many passages of Scripture speak of the Christian's perpetual warfare against the sinful nature. There's a good example in the very next chapter, Romans chapter 7, verse 21, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind. We should not be surprised, therefore, when we find ourselves struggling against sin. We will not be made perfect until we get to glory. And in the meantime, we will have to resist sin with everything we have. And there is also a positive side to our sanctification. It comes at the end of verse 13. It's about offering ourselves to God. Offering ourselves to Him as those who have been brought from death to life. Offering the very parts of our body to Him as instruments of righteousness. You see, we have something much better to do with our bodies than to volunteer them for Satan's service. We're alive from the dead. 
Because God has given himself to us in Christ, and now we can offer ourselves back to God in real gospel holiness. We are to offer him every part of our bodies. We are to offer him renewed minds, which are prepared to think his thoughts after him. We can offer him hands that are ready to do his work, tongues that have been tamed to say what is good and true. We can offer him eyes which do not wander, feet willing to travel in his righteous path. We can offer him our hearts, hearts beating with love for him. The point is that we must offer our whole selves unto God. That's why God saved us. He saved us to live for him, to glorify him with ever-increasing holiness. It's why Jesus died for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, the scripture says, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. One young woman who died to sin in order to live for Christ was Cassie Bernal. I'm sure you know her story. On April 20, 1999, Cassie was killed in the library of Columbine High School in Colorado. Some consider her a martyr. Two of her classmates had gone on a violent rampage, setting off bombs and shooting machine guns. And when they came to Cassie, who was lying face down under a table in the library, they asked her if she believed in God. Yes, she said, according to most accounts. And then they shot her. Now, Cassie Bernal was an unlikely martyr. During her early teenage years, she had begun to dabble in the occult, and yet she continued to attend church, and it was on a youth retreat that she first believed the message of salvation. And from that point forward, she counted herself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. And I close with these words from her diary. Now I have given up on everything else. I found it to be the only way to know Christ and to experience the mighty power that brought him to life again, to find out what it really means to suffer and to die with him. And so whatever it takes, I will be one who lives in the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. Our Father in heaven, this is our prayer too, that whatever it takes, we will be counted among those who are dead to sin, and alive to you through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. You're listening to Every Last Word with Bible teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by, we seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, God's Living Word with Pastor the Rev. Richard Phillips, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free 1-800-488-1888. Again, that's 1-800-488-1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support of this ministry.